experience God evangelism is how we can use our spiritual gifts and train people to use spiritual gifts, to train people uh, how to use their spiritual gifts to bring people to Christ. And also, when people experience the Holy Spirit, when they come to Jesus, we can tell them one day you can also pray for other people to bring them to Christ, to help them to experience the Holy Spirit. Okay, first, when we do evangelism, it's very important to have compassion on the people who are not saved. These people, when they don't have the salvation of Jesus, they will go to hell. And it's terrible there, and they can never get out. And you search online for go to hell, uh, in YouTube, you can see many videos of people, of Christians. Now, Christians who go to hell because God showed them how hell is so that they can come back and tell people. And uh, there are people who went to hell and then they came back and tell people. And I have a video like that too uh, that I, uh, I take an excerpt of someone who went to hell and describe it in detail how it is and uh, I can send it to you in the group. Now we want to bring people to Jesus. The first reason is because of God's love. God loves them. God wants them to enjoy eternity with Him. God wants to bless their whole life. That's the first reason and the main reason. And also the second reason is that uh, when they go, don't go when they don't have the salvation of Jesus, they will go to hell, and that is a terrible place. So they need to understand that. Uh, but that, that's the main, not, that is not the main uh, thrust when we tell people about Jesus. We don't first tell them that if you don't believe in Jesus, you go to hell. We tell them there is a God who loves you very much, and you can enjoy Him forever. And you can enjoy Him now, and He can bless your whole life. And He can bless your marriage, your family, and your, uh, He can give you peace and joy and love and, and provide for your needs. Uh, he can bless you in every way. So th there, is, there are all reasons that we should believe in Jesus. So we want to have compassion on people. Matthew 9.13, but go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. So God is pleased with people who have compassion on other people. When we have compassion on other people, He's very, very happy. And 2 Peter 3, 9, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God doesn't want anyone to perish. He wants everyone to come to repentance and have eternal life. And heaven is perfect. Revelation 21, 4, And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. So in heaven, there is no more tear, no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, and no more pain. And all the former things have passed away, and in heaven it will be total joy and love and enjoyment. It's, it's really the, it's uh, far beyond what we can see and experience on earth here. It's much, much better. And have compassion on people who are not safe, suffering in hell. Mark 9.48, where in hell their, their, their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. So in hell, there will be worms that bite people and there will be fire that is not quenched. And these worms do not die and they are there forever. And the fire does not, is not quenched, it's forever. So there is eternal punishment and separation from God. On earth here, we still enjoy many good things from God. We can enjoy peace. You know, people can enjoy relative peace on earth here. It's, it, it can be peaceful here, especially when we, we walk, you know, in uh, nature, uh, when we walk in the uh, 
forest or go to the beach, we can experience peace there. Or when we look at the sky, uh, especially at night, we can experience peace there. And we can enjoy air, air and water and food here. And in hell, there is no more food or water or peace, no more. And it's only fire. And eternal punishment or eternal life. There are only two choices. Matthew 25, 46, and these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So it's either everlasting punishment or eternal life. And everlasting punishment is always punishment only. And God and other people sow and we reap. John 4, 37, for in this the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I send you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored and you have entered into the labors. Now, what does that mean? This actually, now this is a, a saying that, you know, one sows and another reaps. That's a saying at that time. And in evangelism, that is true for us. God, Jesus sent us to reap that for which we have not labored. We have not change the people's heart. We have not uh, changed the eternal heart of people and convert them. It's God who convert them. So it's others actually represent God. God has labored. God and the Holy Spirit has labored and changed their hearts. And we have entered into the labors and reaped the harvest. So it's God who works in the heart of people and then we just tell them about Jesus and pray for them and then they can come to Jesus. Of course it's not easy because there are many people who are very uh, stubborn and they don't want to res uh, believe in Jesus. Many people reject God but still there are many who believe and these are the people that we, uh, that we bring to Christ. We tell them about Jesus and, and then the and then God can help them experience God. Okay, the process of experience God evangelism, how can we do it? First, we converse with the person and listen and respond to their feelings and needs. So we first we talk with them, listen to them, and respond to their feelings and their needs. They have feelings, they have needs, they are unhappy about certain things, they, uh, they have certain needs. We listen to them and talk with them and care about them. And uh, in the future sessions, we'll talk about counseling. And then uh, we will talk about how to respond to people's feelings. And then share how we or someone else has similar problems and experience help from God. So I hope we all have experienced God in some way. That when we pray, we can experience peace and joy and love. And then also many of us have experienced deliverance from evil spirit or deliverance from inner hurts that we can tell people or experience healing of the body. So we can tell people how we have experienced God or experience help in our daily life or provision and invite him to receive the laying on of hands. So do you want, so we can ask them, do you want me to pray for you to experience the Holy Spirit, experience the blessings of God? And then if he is willing, then we tell them, okay, I'm going to lay hand on you. Uh, generally, we lay hand on the, on the shoulder. And then pastors can also lay hand on the head. Uh, but lay people, it's better that they don't lay hand on the head. That, uh, so pastors can lay hand on the head and the shoulder. So uh, when we pray for the person, we lead the person to relax. So we tell him to relax and enjoy God and to open the heart to love God. So we tell them, okay, God is going to bless you. Just relax, don't put down your burdens and think of God, think of Him loving you. He wants to bless you. So in the process, we can enjoy God and open your heart to God. You want God to bless you. So you cry out to God, Lord, I need you. Lord, Lord I want you. Lord, I hunger for you. So we lead them to hunger for God. And then, so in the prayer, we, we pray like this. Thank you, Jesus, for loving us. You, you have died for our sins. 
And when we confess our sins, you are sure to forgive us and give us eternal life. We have, we have lied to people. We have hurt people's feelings. We have told, we have uh, not cared about people's feelings. Please forgive our sins. We have lust. Please forgive our sins and wash us clean with the blood of Jesus. And thank you, Jesus, for your love. You care about us. You are with us all the time. You are blessing us right now. Thank you, Jesus, for loving us. So use the prayer that I, I, I talked about earlier, the prayer of grace, uh, prayer of worship, and also interactive prayer. So we use all these three kinds of prayer to help people experience and think about God's love. And then after the prayer, we'll say, please keep your eyes closed. Have you experienced anything during the prayer? So we'll ask the person to keep the eyes closed because when they keep the eyes closed, then they are not distracted by the things around them. And then we ask them, have you experienced anything during the prayer? So have you, uh, if the person uh, don't know what we mean, you can say, experience anything in your heart, over your body. Now, if the person has experienced some work from God, we can explain from the Bible that these are works of the Holy Spirit. So some people experience peace and comfort, burdens go away, love. Would, now, we have talked about this earlier, that uh, how we can experience God. Let me go back to that, uh, how we can experience God. Okay, here, peace in John 14:27. Burdens removed, Matthew eleven twenty eight. All you who are, who are who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest and body in rest and comfort. Psalm sixteen nine. My f my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope. So we should be familiar with these passages and familiar with how we can experience the Holy Spirit and love. Romans 5.5, 5, because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And then inner healing. Isaiah 61.1, 1, He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. And physical healing. Isaiah 53.5, by His stripes we are healed and demons being driven out. Mark 16.17, in my name they will cast out demons. So we can ask them, have you experienced any of this? If they have experienced this, then we say, you know, God has worked in your life. Uh, so we explain from the Bible that these are the works of the Holy Spirit. And then we can say, you have experienced the work of God. Do you want God to bless your whole life? So, and if He's willing, then we uh, explain that Jesus is God and has died for our sins to forgive our sins and give us eternal life. Ask if He is willing to accept Jesus as His Savior. So, we want to explain, when we explain the gospel, it's not just explain what people do, it's explain what God has done. Jesus had died, that Jesus is God, and He has died for our sins, to forgive our sins, and give us eternal life. He's, he's in, he came from heaven. He has, you know, he has enjoyed heaven for eternity. He did, he did not have to come to earth, but He came to earth because He loved us. And He died for us. He suffered for us so that we can be free of the punishment. We should be punished, but He was punished for us. So if you trust in Jesus as your Savior, then He, he took away your sins and then you have eternal life. So, uh, so are you willing to accept Jesus as your Savior? And then ask Him to follow the sinner's prayer. So uh, this is a sample prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that you are God. I'm sorry for my sins. I've hurt other people's feelings. I have yelled at people. I have lied. I have been greedy and selfish. And I've lust. Thank you for dying on the cross to pay for the penalties of my sins. Please forgive my sins and give me eternal life. Thank you for loving me and giving me eternal life. I love you. I'm willing to follow you and love you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So basically, it's a prayer to confess who Jesus is, you are God, and confess our sins and ask Jesus, uh, thank 
Jesus for dying on the cross for our sins and we ask Him to forgive us and give us eternal life and then we thank God and love God and then we can also enjoy God. Thank you for uh, uh, giving me salvation. Thank you for giving me peace and joy and love. So we can ask people have they experienced the peace and the burdens go away. They have. Then we say, God is so real to you. God has come to you. So the point of this evangelism is that people can experience the presence of God. So we have to practice this in a church. We practice praying for each other, praying when people have taken care of their sins and evil spirit and their problems in life, and then they can practice praying for each other. If we have prayed for them for a period of time and they don't have any evil spirit, they can practice praying for each other and then ask each other, uh, have you experienced anything during the prayer? And then if the, the other person has experienced the Holy Spirit, then he can tell the first person, yes, I have experienced peace or power or love or joy. And then, uh, so we practice doing this in the church. And then we can do it to our family members. And then we can do it to the friends. And then we can do it to the people on the street. Or even, you know, just outside the church, we can have evangelistic meetings. We can have music. And then we invite people to come and then afterwards we can pray for the people, lay hands on the people. We are trained. We can train a group of people who can pray for people to experience the Holy Spirit. And these people have experience. Now I have prayed for many, many people, uh, tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands. I, met, I don't know how many times I've prayed for people. So I know how it feels when a person experiences the Holy Spirit, I can feel a strong presence when someone is open to the Holy Spirit. I can feel power, I can feel peace, I can feel something surrounding me. If the person is open, that I can feel the presence of God stronger when that person is open. And uh, so, but no matter what, we still ask them. Some people we don't experience we don't feel the presence of God so much and they still have experienced the Holy Spirit. And some people are very obvious. They, you can see their body swaying. Sometimes people fall down and people cry or they laugh from the holy laughter. They're filled with the joy of the Lord. That We can tell immediately that this person has experienced the Holy Spirit or this person is greatly touched and, and then uh, uh, he, the person is crying or expressing that God is so wonderful, God is so wonderful, then we know that He has experienced the Holy Spirit powerfully. And then after the prayer, you know, He's willing to pray the sinner's prayer to confess the sins. And then we ask the person if he has sincerely repented of his sins and asked Jesus to be a Savior. And if he says he has, then we can tell him that the Bible promises us that he is forgiven and will have eternal life. So if a person confesses his sins and trusts in Jesus as the Savior, then he has eternal life. Okay, and then we should tell the person how he can continue to follow God. So it's just not just one time. Now many people just stop there. We don't just stop there. We want to help the people to continue to follow God. So we, we need to tell them how to continue to repent of his sins every day. When we are angry with people, when we have sinful thoughts, when we have lust, when we have impatience with people, when we yell at people, when, he, uh, when we tell lies, immediately we know that we have sinned. Or when we don't have a close relationship with God, that is already a sin. When we don't pray to Him, when we don't have a close relationship with Him. So continue to repent and trust in Jesus as His Savior that we, he hold on to Jesus, Jesus, please forgive me and give me eternal life. That he say, yes, Lord, please give me eternal life so I don't go to hell. So I will go to heaven one day and now I can have eternal life with you. That I can have a personal relationship with you. And continue to have this personal relationship with God by reading the Bible. It's very important that new Christians should learn to read the Bible and they can start reading the New Testament first. After they read the New Testament a few times, they can start to read the Old Testament. But when they read the Old Testament, they should also read the New Testament at the same time. Because the Old Testament sometimes 
the passages are not very devotional because some passages are hard to understand and they might not be very helpful immediately to the spiritual life. But in the New Testament, generally, the passages are more devotional, can help spiritual life directly. The Old Testament, for instance, some of the historical part of Israel, how they sin in the wilderness, and it doesn't help uh, the spiritual life immediately, uh, or about uh, some prophets, uh, the, uh, very long passages, uh, or the book of Job. So they need to read the New Testament at the same time for devotional purpose, but at the same time they read the Old Testament to understand the full wisdom of God. And all Christians should learn to understand the Bible. Uh, if they understand something and they think that part is good, they can mark the Bible. The part they don't understand, they can ask someone or wait for a second time they read, a third time they read, maybe they can understand. And uh, also praying and praising God and teach them the three kinds of prayer, as well as prayer of intercession, praying for other people in the church and the area. But there should be the uh, prayer of grace to declare the grace of God and prayer of worship to worship God. And the uh, interactive prayer when we pray to believe that God is really uh, listening uh, to us and He will respond to us and He will bless us. He is happy that we pray to Him when we pray with a sincere heart and go to church to worship God and also not only to worship God but also to interact with other Christians to practice serving God to bless other Christians and to learn how to serve God so they should be taught how to follow God and then continue to love God with all his heart that uh, the relationship with God must include loving God and obey God, especially to tell people about Jesus and to follow Jesus. So to obey God, to tell people about Jesus, that means to do evangelism. To obey God, to love God, to love people and not to sin. And to, uh, it's very important that we understand when we believe in Jesus, it's not just believing. It's let Jesus taking over our life. To let Jesus be the Lord of our life. That He take over our thoughts, our inner life, our motives, our words, our action, our family, our work, our relationship with people, our conversation with people, everything. We let God take over and then our whole life will be blessed. So being a Christian is not just believing. It's letting God take over our whole life and bless us. Now God is not like Satan. When Satan takes over a person, the person doesn't have free will. But when God takes over a person, the person has free will. He has freedom. He has joy. He, can, uh, he will have the move of the Holy Spirit to how to obey God. Now, he also will have the sinful uh, nature. But when he noticed the action of the sinful nature, the thoughts of the sinful nature, he should repent. For instance, he might want to be angry with someone. He might want to have lust. Uh, might want to say negative words. Uh, and then he should immediately notice that and then ask God to forgive him. So we do have this new nature and a sinful nature. The more a person loves God and follow God and obey God, the more his new nature will be stronger. And the more the person immerse himself in sins. There are people who go to church and they immerse themselves in sins, in anger, in lust, in greed. And uh, they just think about women, they just think about sex. And what happens is their mind is filled with lust and sins. And then they will have problems. This new nature will be very, very weak. This question, these Christians will oppose many words of God. And, and it's easy for them to fall away from God. So it's very important for us to tell them to obey God and let God be the Lord. And obeying God is not just doing, but a relationship with God. Let God change him. It's very important. It's the relationship with God. It's living in God's love and peace and joy. Now, when people live in love, the love of God and the joy of the Lord, when people live in that, then his whole life will be always filled with 
joy and peace and motivation. But if person, if a person just, you know, they live in the law, it just I have to pray, I have to obey God. It's just thinking, I have to, I have to, I have to do this. And sooner or later, you can lose the motivation. But if he think of God loving them, and when then, whenever they pray, they experience the peace and joy, and they say, this is God moving in my heart. This is God working in my heart. God is with me. God is with me. When he can say that, God is with me. God is blessing me all the time. And he can enjoy God. Then he will enjoy the relationship with God. And then he will have the motivation to follow God and obey God. So it's very important that we are motivated by the relationship with God and by God's love and joy and peace instead of motivated by the law. Now we should be motivated by the law, reminded by the law not to sin. The sin can end up in hell. Sin can bring destruction. But that should not be the main motivation. The main motivation should be the relationship with God and the peace and love and joy of God to motivate us. That we say, God is so good. God is so good. I want Him. I want to follow Him. So you notice there are some Christians, they are just motivated by the law. They push by the law. And then what happens is, you notice that they, they, they have a lot of pressure. They don't think that, they don't believe that God is in control of everything. They don't think that God is in control of the world, of our uh, provision, of uh, the work of the church. They don't think that God is in control of those things. They, they, they think that it's God's, it's human's work. It's human, they think it's human, uh, our work. But it's God's work, God changing the people. So we should live in the love of God and motivated by the love of God to be changed by God. And then to serve God. Anything we do to glorify God and bless people are serving God. So we start to tell people about how wonderful God is and, and, and uh, tell people about how God has blessed us and God wants to bless them also and pray for them. These are all serving God. Uh, and of, of course, if the person can serve God in church, it would be great. But he first starts with, Glorifying God and telling people about Jesus. That is serving God in our daily life. Okay, and then using experience God evangelism. We can make friends with people whom we see and be kind and helpful to them. And find opportunities to chat with them and share with them about our experiences of God's blessings and respond to their needs and feelings. So it's from our daily life. We want to make friends with people. We want to talk with people relate to them and observe them if they are unhappy we can ask them uh, how are you are you unhappy about something are you burdened about something and then respond to their needs and help them and and also offer to pray for them and say god can bless your life so if we notice people how they are then we have more chances to bring the gospel to them that if we tell them God is so wonderful, you can experience Him, you can experience His help. Even when you have financial problems, when you love God and trust in God and have a close relationship with Him and fulfill your responsibilities. Of course, we don't just pray and then money will come to us. We also need to take care of our life and do our work faithfully. Whatever job we have, we do faithfully. Whatever work we have, we do faithfully. If we don't have a job, we ask God to provide us with a job. And we also prepare ourselves to be ready to do different kinds of jobs. So we can help people to manage their life so that the whole life is, is managed by God. And then God can bless the whole life. And then they can see, wow, after I believe in Jesus, God is providing for me, God is blessing my family and everything. And then they will tell other people about how wonderful God is. So if we live a life like that, then people will be attracted by God. And then we train the people, always tell people how wonderful God is, how God is doing these wonderful things. He is a wonderful God. He's a loving God. He is a caring God. And when we, the more we experience Him, the more we want to tell po people about Jesus. So I hope we all live a life like that. And then people will be attracted by us. And the church 
will be full of joyful people, full of people who are energetic and who wants to tell people about Jesus. And then we also teach people how to minister negative emotions. If there are problems at home, how not to be affected by the problems at home and love the people in the family. And then the more love they have and the motivation to care about the family, then the more the family will change and then they will enjoy the family more and the family will become better so that they are not burdened by the problems in the family. And then the people in the church will have, you know, they will have more joy and have a better family and then they have more strength to glorify God and bless other people. So that's, uh, we want to relate to people and care about them. And, uh, and then find a chance to tell them about God's blessings. And then we can invite people to activities or even treat them with meals and then invite them to accept prayers. So we can treat them with meals, we can prepare some food and bring to the family or we can bring, prepare some food in our family and invite them to come and then tell them about Jesus and ask them if they're willing that I pray for you to experience the Holy Spirit. So we can invite people to activities and then the church can plan activities. Uh, uh, maybe in front of the church that uh, we can have music and then invite people when they come by and then we can tell them about Jesus and pray for them and then uh, bring them to Jesus. So we can have this outreach regularly in a church. And then we want to train people who can pray for others. The training should include, so we train people to pray for other people. First, they build up a strong relationship with God and strong anointing in the Holy Spirit. So they first, they would learn to build up a strong relationship with God, to trust in God, that God loves them when they, uh, God loves everyone. And when they come to God, they pray to God, God is very happy. Now, many people have, they worry about the relationship with God because they don't understand God. They think it's very hard to, to have a close relationship with God. They say, I have sins, I have weaknesses, I don't pray enough, and therefore my relationship with God is not so good. But actually, it's not hard. It's not hard to have a close relationship with God. So I hope you remember this, how to have uh, that, not is uh, how to understand that it's not hard to be, have a close relationship with God. First, when we repent, now first is God loving us. God loves us all the time. And then when we repent, God is very happy. The Bible says that the whole heaven will rejoice over us when we repent. And then when we trust in Jesus, Jesus is for sure happy. If we repent, He's happy. Then when we trust in Jesus, He is very happy. And then when we pray to Him, then He will also come to us. When we dwell in Him, He will dwell in us. And then uh, He always comes to us and then we'll bear fruit. And then when we... Uh, love Him, He'll prepare for us things uh, we cannot imagine. Eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, and the human mind cannot think of. He will prepare for us we can never imagine. So, God is so easy to relate to when we love Him. Now, when we cannot love Him much, we'll say, Lord, help me how to love You. Now, to love Him is very simple, to appreciate Him. Appreciate the food He gave us, appreciate our body, appreciate the nature, appreciate the salvation, appreciate the work of the Holy Spirit moving in our heart to repentance and to trust in Jesus and obey Jesus. Thank you for this. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. So when we see that God is loving us all the time, then, it's, then, it's, uh, then we love Him. You know, whenever we love Him, He is very happy. So it's not hard. Now, people may say my love for God is very small, very little love. It doesn't matter. When you start to love Him, He's happy. And then you will love Him more. He's more happy, more pleased with you. But if you just start a little, just a little love, you just say, thank you, Jesus. I really sincerely thank you. Then already God is very happy. So it's not hard to please God, not hard to have a close relationship with Him. Now, of course, to have a deep relationship, very strong relationship, Sometimes it takes time. Sometimes it takes time to have a close relationship. And when we haven't come to that point, it doesn't matter. We start to repent and love God and obey Him 
and pray to him, he is already very happy. And that's why Jesus said, when you give a cup of cold water to a little one, you'll by no means lose your reward. So it's not only when you can do a great thing for God. Even when you uh, give a cup of water to someone because he's a Christian or because you want to bring the person to Jesus, to believe in Jesus, already God will reward you. So that shows that God is happy with every little thing we do. So if God is happy with every little thing I do, when I do more, He's more happy, He's more pleased with me, and He'll bless my whole life. And it's, He first loves us. Even when we, I'm not perfect, I cannot do much. Even when I do a little, He still likes me, He's pleased with me, and He wants to bless me. So it's not hard to build a strong relationship with God. So that's very important that we first believe that and we first have this close relationship with God that all the time we say, I'm enjoying God. To believe that we are enjoying God. But many people live in the law. They will say, oh, I still have sins. I still tell lies. I still get angry. Now, when we do those things, we just repent. Lord, help me, help me, help me. We ask God to help me, not to be angry, not to have lust and to honor respect each person not to look at a person of the opposite sex as a sex object but to respect the person then we'll have you know we'll take care of the lust and whenever we have any lust we'll say god please forgive me and take away the lust and i i don't want to think about uh, women i don't want to think about sex then when we are trying that god is already very happy god doesn't wait until we're perfect before he's, he is happy. When we start to change, when we want to change, he's already very happy. So, so when we have sins, we don't have to be burdened by the sins. We can say, I'm improving, I'm improving, and God is very happy. I'm trusting in God, God is very happy. So the concentration is always in God. You notice my teaching. I thank God for this teaching. It's from the Bible. The Bible always talks about God. It's only when people sometimes they they're under the law. They always talk about what you do, what you do. Now, I tell you what to do also. But I first talk about God. And I and tell people it's not hard to follow God and obey God. It's not hard at all. Because God is happy with every little thing we do for Him. So we want to build up a strong relationship with God and a strong anointing of the Holy Spirit. When we love God, when we honor God, we like God, then the anointing of God will be strong upon us. We spend more time praying. And you can see that in the videos I just sent in the groups, you can see that how the people experience the Holy Spirit. So it's something we can uh, train the people, train a group of people that they learn to pray for people. They pray a lot. There are people, especially they have more time, they pray a lot. And then they pray for people. And then these people can be trained to do evangelism. And it can bring revival to churches. Now many people say, my members don't love God. Now when we have a life of loving God, when we tell people how easy it is to love God, because God is so lovely. And when we love God, He's very happy. Even when we just have a little love for God, God is very happy then people would have less pressure. Then they would say, oh, I, I did love God and God is happy already. So we tell people, even if they do love God a little bit, God is already very happy. Then they don't have pressure. They, they don't feel pressed to love God. They feel they want to love God. I use an illustration. When someone just falls in love, generally he doesn't have much pressure. He will enjoy the time with his girlfriend or boyfriend. Uh, I mean, it's her, bo her boyfriend or his girlfriend. Okay, it's very, for sure it has to be opposite sex. When people fall in love, then it's very natural that this person is attracted by the other person. He likes to be, spend time with the person and likes to talk with the other person. Now, but sometimes people cannot keep the relationship. And then after marriage, they start to, to be annoyed by the spouse and then they don't have interest. Now, for us, the motivation, I hope 
that you will enjoy God like someone who falls in love with someone, that we fall in love with God. God, you're so wonderful, you're so wonderful. And then we keep that relationship. Now, many people, after they get married because they see the other person falls, then they start to criticize the other person and then it, it hurts the relationship. Instead of criticizing the rela uh, what the other person cannot do or what they do, what we do is to guide them and tell them, I will be very happy when you can do this. Oh, you do this for me, I'm very happy and I need your help. Please do it together with me. So we can guide them and whenever they help, and then they will say, I'm so happy and I'm, I'm happy to talk with you. I'm, I'm happy to listen to you. I want to know more about you. So we want to build up the relationship. Now we'll talk about that more in the future about a uh, family relationship. So when we build up the relationship, then the whole lifetime we can enjoy the marriage. So with God also, then we know that God loves us so much. He's not like any spouse on earth. God is perfect. He's always loving, He's always kind, always holy, never commit any single sin. And so, and also He always appreciates what we do for Him, a little thing we do for Him, a little thing we do to approach Him, to come to Him. He's always very happy. So it's not hard to have a close relationship with Him at all. So people, when they learn that, they like God, and then it will be always like falling in love with God, and then they can enjoy the relationship with God all the time. Okay? So build up the strong relationship with God, and then the strong anointing. And then take care of different problems of life, sins. It's not hard to take care of sins when we know that sins are destructive. Sins will give the devil a foothold. Sins will let the devil come in to steal our family, steal our a peace, a joy, and love, and our ministry, and our reputation, everything we have, and the money we have, everything we have, sins can destroy, Satan can destroy. So when we know that it's very destructive, whenever we have sinful thought, we say, I don't want to sin. Even when the other person sin first, when the other person yell at us, we say, it is his problem. It doesn't matter if he yells at me, I don't if I don't take it seriously, I don't lose anything. If he yells at me, if it is, my, it is my fault, I'll admit my fault and apologize to him. If it's not my fault, I still say, okay, I, uh, I hear you, I want to build up a good relationship with you. What can I do to, uh, to make the relationship better? What can we do? And I'll be very happy if we can talk and talk peacefully and try to build a close relationship. So this is a peaceful way to handle problems instead of having anger and yelling at the other person or lust. We know that when we have lust, then God is not pleased with us and we will not have a good marriage. But if we take care of our lust and honor people and love people and God will provide for us the best spouse and then we can enjoy the relationship in a marriage and then we won't have lust that we have this wife or husband that we can enjoy and greed, we don't need to greed for things because God will give us the best and negative thinking and emotions, people say oh things are difficult, it's hard, life is difficult it's no use, I, I, I'm pessimistic, I cannot do anything many people are pessimistic and they always look at the negative sides of things but with when we have God, God will bless us when we seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and we, when we love Him, He will give us everything. So we can be very positive. We can be positive about everything. Even when there are difficulties, God will always have a way to overcome it. This difficulty seems to be very high in our eyes, but in God's eyes it is very low. So I use an illustration. To walk over a desert is very difficult, but to fly over a desert is very easy. So with God, we can say, God, you have a way to help me overcome the problem. Actually, God is in control of everything. If we trust God and obey God and love Him and let Him take care of our problems and submit to Him, He will help us overcome a problem like flying over it. And then we just trust in God and we are kind to the other person, we are nice to the other person, then we won't have uh, 
negative thinking and if we won't be worrying or influence from people if they have problems it's their problem I don't have to carry their anger I don't have to carry their worry I will tell them God loves them God cares about them and I pray for them for peace and I try to be peaceful with them and then I guide them to have a relationship good relationship with us and with other people and marriage how to honor our spouse and respect our spouse and really treasure our spouse now I treasure my wife very much it's wonderful to have my wonderful wife and it's wonderful to have her and I treasure her I don't want her to feel unhappy at all I want her to enjoy my relation our relationship I, I want her to enjoy our marriage all the time so I don't want to cause her to feel to, un, to be unhappy at all if I have done anything uh, bad that doesn't make her feel happy I say sorry and I will pay attention I try to listen to her and respond to her uh, but many husbands are impatient with the wife they say my wife requests a lot they, she wants a lot and then we listen to her listen to her what does she want what does she worry about and now very often because wives want the husband to listen to her and talk with her and communicate but many husband doesn't want to do it because they're not used to doing it we want to listen to her and and care about her and then and when we cannot understand her we can tell her I, I, I cannot understand you please tell me your feelings very clearly please help me to understand you then the wife generally would be happy to tell you and then when we, you try to do what the wife wants then usually uh, the, the marriage will be better and personal relationship with other people that we want to respond to other people and care about other people and then the relationship will be better and also take care of evil spirit if a person has evil spirit then he build up the strong relationship with God and take care of different problems and then in Jesus name he can cast out the evil spirit and when he loves God more then he will be filled with the Holy Spirit and the evil spirit will go away so these are ways how to prepare train people who can pray for other people first build up strong relationship with with God and a strong anointing with the Holy Spirit and you can feel the anointing you can feel the anointing when two persons come together and pray for each other you can feel a power in between us you can feel a power pushing you and then take care of different problems and then see ability to listen to people and empathize with them that's very important as pastors too we want to listen to people now some people think if I listen to them then I'm then I have to obey them we don't have to obey them but we want to respond to people's needs now many husbands don't want to listen to the wife because they say then my wife will tell me to do this to do that and I don't want to do those things you know if those things are reasonable we should love our wife as Christ loves the church so we should respond to her if it's not reasonable we'll talk with her and uh, find out you know what is best for them and then uh, if it's really not workable then we should we can find a counselor of marriage and and then if you have questions about that you can send the questions to me and I can respond to you so we need to learn to listen to people and care about people then we have better relationships so people who pray for people people who serve God need to learn to listen to people need to listen to their spouse and the family members listen to the friends listen to the brothers and sisters in church in, a, in Christ and care about people and respond to people this I will talk more in the counseling part this is very important that there are people who who pray a lot they pray a lot but their relationship with people is very weak because they don't listen to people they don't care about people they just command the wife to do things they just command the wife to submit to him you know the Bible does say the wife submit to your husband that it does but it doesn't tell the husband to command your wife to submit to you the Bible tells the husband to love the wife as Christ has loves the church so when we love the wife then the wife will be happy to submit to the husband so this all work together it's not a one-way communication it's not just commanding so we want to listen be able to listen to people and empathize with people and 
listen to their feelings or they feel unhappy and I can tell them yes I heard that you are unhappy I know it's not easy for you it must give you pressure I know that you're not feeling happy about it tell me more about it so we can name, say what they just said or they, we can ask them are you feeling unhappy are you feeling pressured are you feeling are you worrying so we can ask them and let them explain to us and we try to understand first we can practice with our spouse or with the brother and sister in the church to listen to them see if we can understand the other, the other person and if we, we and then we ask the person did I respond to you well so this is something we can practice let one person describe to us what he's experiencing what are his problems what are his feelings and then we respond to the person respond to the feelings only not to teach it's very important not to teach to respond for instance if you are hurt by someone you're hurt by someone and you are you are uh, painful and you tell someone oh someone just hurt me just someone just hit me and then the person will say well you shouldn't have done that you shouldn't have given that person a chance you shouldn't have you know you you, you didn't protect yourself that's why he beat you or you, you said something wrong that's why he beat you so that is teaching now when you have been hurt by someone beaten by someone do you want someone to teach you or do you want someone to say oh it must hurt it must hurt now that the person beats you so seriously I'm sorry to hear this can I do what can I do how can I fix your wound so that's caring right listening you want people to listen to your hurts or if someone who just have a fight with a spouse and come to you and then you say you shouldn't you should have loved him or her more you shouldn't have fight with her but that person has just been hurt by the other person and then we can say now we don't have to say the other person is terrible we don't have to say that we just say I know that you have problem in your marriage and now you're feeling unhappy we just empathize with the feeling I know you are unhappy I know that you have you feel pressure you feel uh, you feel unhappy you feel it's difficult you think uh, marriage can be difficult I know that for now you know that you is uh, it makes you feel unhappy so we empathize with them and then we gradually guide them now this will do in counseling how to guide them to build up a stronger relationship with the with the spouse so we need to learn to listen to people so that they're not just preaching to people now some people doing evangelism is just preaching preaching they don't listen to the other person we want to listen and understand how they are what they are worrying about what they are thinking uh, even when people are worshiping some idols we want to listen to them why do you want to worship those idols does do the idols help you do you feel peaceful when you worship these idols do you feel love and joy and blessings are they helping you so we can ask them questions to understand them and to respond to the situation okay and the ability not to give pressure to people but to care for them when we do evangelism we don't want to give pressure when we give pressure it's only a one-time evangelism and they don't want to listen to us anymore but if we listen to them and care for them and and we say oh I know that you are facing difficulties I know that it's not easy for you then they are open to us and then we say we pray for you you know there is soft evangelism it's meeting their needs first I can pray for your needs or we can say I'll pray for your needs first and then next step is I pray for you to overcome your problems and to face your needs so first I say can I pray for your needs and then we pray for their needs just softer evangelism the f bringing the person the first step to try to trust in Jesus and the next step is can I pray for you to experience the help from God to lay hand on the person so it's uh, and then if the person experiences the Holy Spirit but doesn't want to believe in Jesus we don't want to press we don't want to pressure them we can still keep praying for them next time next time and eventually we can bring the person to Jesus even if they don't believe after many times we still are patient that way the person will, will see our care and our love it's not just I want him to believe it's I care for him so I want to, him to believe and then practice practicing 
laying hands on people to help them to experience the Holy Spirit. So in the church practice praying for each other. Now it's very important for us to build up this prayer team. If you have a prayer team in the church, then the church can grow faster. So we want to build up a prayer team, a team of people who can pray for each other, who can uh, practice praying for each other, and then, uh, and then they ask the other person, have you experienced anything? And then they gradually can sense what the other person experienced. F, ability to follow up on people to grow in the Lord. So how to help people to grow in the Lord? How to help people to keep trusting in God, keep praising God, keep following God, keep obeying God. Okay, and then four, build up a prayer team of the church. The prayer team should be trained in the above training. So the last page we talked about how to train the people who pray for other people. The prayer team will invite anyone who comes to the church to accept prayer for strength or for evangelism. So this prayer team, when they come to church, when people come to the church, they can ask them, can I pray for you? Do you like me to pray for you? Or is there anything I can pray for you? So it depends on how they ask. Uh, sometimes, you know, even Christian, we can say, is there anything I can pray for you? So they can pray for anyone in the church and pray for anyone from the outside. But for people from the outside, we want to ask them first, uh, to know them first, know how they are, uh, uh, do they have any needs, uh, what attract them to the church, that we are happy to see them, do you like me to pray for you? So they will invite people in the church and the people from the outside. And when we have love for people, then people will be happy that we pray for them. But if people feel pressure, then after a few times they don't want to pray for them anymore. So they invite people in the church and people that newcomers to pray for strength for Christians or revival or for evangelism. And it's important not to pressure people and to allow people to reject being prayed for. So if someone says, no, I don't want to be prayed for, then it will say, it's okay, God bless you. And then uh, we can tell these people, okay, when you, uh, next time we can ask them again. But if he says, I, I don't want to be prayed for, then we, we, then we say, okay, if anytime you want me to pray for you, please let me know, I'm happy to pray for you. And there should be evaluation of prayer team members. This is for improvement and to prevent some improper behavior of the prayer te team members. So there should be evaluation. They evaluate each other and the pastor can eva evaluate them and they can evaluate themselves. They can share what they experience when they pray for people. Now for any groups of people who serve God, any people who serve God, there should be meetings of these people to evaluate what they do and to share their difficulties and their success and to teach them how to do better. For any ministry, instead of just letting them do it week after week, like the, prayer, the, the worship team, we want to ask them how they feel when they are leading worship. Do they have pressure? And... Uh, and then ask them uh, how they want to improve. Uh, you know, sometimes they will tell you, I'm under pressure. They, they have pressure too. So the prayer team members will ask them how they are, uh, uh, how they are when they pray for each other and how we can improve. And then so the pastor can teach on how to improve how they pray for people. And then the team members should be uh, appreciated in public. Any any people who serve God should be appreciated in public. So we thank God for these people and we clap our hands to appreciate these people. We shake hands with them and to say we thank you for praying for us. We, it's so blessed to have the prayer team. So I hope we build a prayer team and this will raise up their spiritual gifts. Because when these people pray for people, some people discover that they have the word of wisdom and words of knowledge, that they would know things about this person that they did not know previously, that they would know something uh, in their life. Now, when the person sends something in their life, uh, please don't say, God tell me that you have this problem. But instead, the person can say, um, do you have any problem you are facing? And uh, 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 for instance, the person sends that person might have problem in the marriage. 
and the person can say, "Are you? Uh, how is your marriage? Uh, can I pray for your marriage?" So approach it like that instead of saying, "God tells me you have a problem in your marriage," because he might not be accurate, and it can give people pressure. So it's better that we ask people gently, "Can I pray for your marriage?" Uh, is there, for instance, he senses that the person has some sins, then he can say. Uh, do you want me to pray for you for strength in the Lord, to grow in the Lord, and to overcome sins and to have holiness, you know? And then the person said yes, and then we say, okay, um, what can I pray for specifically? So, uh, so we should learn how to, you know, um, how to understand people's needs and to uh, approach them in a way that is caring, not giving them pressure. They feel loved. That's how we, we grow in praying for people, and these people should be appreciated. We appreciate them. Okay? So, um, uh, this is all for today, and I'm going to conclude by saying that uh, forming a prayer team, or just at the beginning, just Training a few people who can pray for other people can be a, uh, a way of ministry. So if there are people who are faithful in God, who are loving God, who are obeying God, and don't have evil spirit, then they can be trained to pray for other people. And then sometimes it, you can start with one, and then two, and three. And then gradually you have more and more people, and then you evaluate with them how they are doing. And then they can improve. And then we can help them to do better and better. And when th these people operate under the Holy Spirit in these spiritual gifts, gradually more gifts will come out. Some of these people might say, I, I want to uh, try to lead worship. I, I, have a, you know, I want to be trained to lead worship. Or they want to say, I want to be trained to how to share the gospel, how to share my personal experiences, how to also maybe even how to preach the word of God, how to explain the Bible passages to people. So these people, when they serve God, when they start to serve God, they will notice that they have strengths in certain area. Sometimes strengths in evangelism, in helping people spiritually, in teaching, in preaching, in leading worship, in praying for people, in uh, administration, in helping the church to grow, in finding direction for the church. And all this will bring strong spiritual gifts to the church and will bring growth in the church. Now, you might say, I don't have people like that in the church. Well, then we start with first building up their spiritual life. They like God. They enjoy God. They appreciate God, and they experience God all the time. So we, now I pray for my people all the time. We want to pray for people all the time to help them to raise up their spiritual life, to strengthen their spiritual life, to, to uh, help them to experience the Holy Spirit more. So they grow more and more. So they start to grow from, you know, a, being a weak Christian to a stronger Christian, and then a Christian who is motivated to serve God. And then we train them gradually, one by one, to pay attention to each person, to, to see that each person is very precious, to train them. Now sometimes even children can be trained. Some children are very responsive to the gospel, to praying. And then you can say you can pray for your friend and train them. Children can serve God also. Children can also have strong anointing of God. So I hope that you'll find people who are willing to serve God in your church who love God, who appreciate God, who are motivated by God's love, and then you can train them, and then these people can serve God. Okay, so God use you to raise up the spiritual life in your church, and if you have questions, please send it to me. Okay, so I'm sharing with you how to, how to pray for people, how to do evangelism with experience God evangelism, and also how to raise up people with praying for them and how to raise up people to pray for other people, and then raise up a prayer team, raise up people who 
are strong spiritually and who have the anointing of the Holy Spirit to pray for people and then church will be strong and then these people also train them how to teach the Bible how to teach people the Bible so that the foundation in the Word of God is very firm and strong okay we'll pray now and ask for God's anointing and the peace and the joy of the Lord thank you Jesus thank you Lord hallelujah praise you father you're so wonderful you're so wonderful you are a wonderful God you are loving God and in you we have no pressure when we have a relationship with good with God it's always enjoyable we can experience your love your joy your peace you always accept us you care about us you want to bless us father we thank you we have you it's so wonderful it's so wonderful to have you we want to enjoy you we want to love you we want to serve you we want to raise up people to serve you lord jesus give us the motivation help us to experience you more help us to experience you more thank you jesus thank you jesus help us to find people who are more willing to serve god that we want to raise up all people to be to experience the holy spirit more and then some people would learn to pray for people and then train them help them to to build up a strong relationship with god and build, take care of different problems in their life to have a pure motives to pray for people to train them to raise them up to serve god lord jesus help us and also help people to have a pure heart not to serve god for the wrong reasons and serve God with a pure heart, not with lust. Now, some people pray for people with lust. They want to touch the women. So uh, generally, except for the pastor, people should only pray for people of the same sex. And we pray that, that they will be kept in purity, that they are not uh, uh, attracted by sins and then they're destroyed by the sins and then destroy the church. Lord, help us to build up people who have spiritual life, who have strong spiritual life. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You are so wonderful. You are so wonderful. You are so good. We want, we thank you. We want, we want your, you to take over our life and we enjoy you. Whenever we follow you, you are very happy. When we love you, you are very happy. When we obey you, you are very happy. When we want to serve you, you are very happy. Thank you. We can enjoy you. It's so wonderful. We love you. We are enjoy you we enjoy serving you we enjoy worshiping you we enjoy praying for people we want to let god work in our life and work in the life of our people thank you jesus thank you jesus hallelujah we have no burdens hallelujah ha 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 we have no burdens ha 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 thank you jesus thank you jesus in jesus name we pray amen hallelujah god bless you God be with you and God use you. And if you are building up a prayer team in your church, please let me know how it's going. How it's going. Whether it's going well or have difficulties, please let me know. That's how then I can mentor you in your, in your ministry. It's not just learning. I can mentor you. So in these groups, you can send me questions about your church, how to help your church to grow. How to grow, how to help your church to grow, to reach out to people, how to pray for people, to reach out to people, and bring more people to the church, and bring revival to the Christians, and bring uh, the Christians to serve God so that your church can grow. So you can respond to me, and I can respond to you, and to help your church to grow, to mentor you in your ministry. God bless you. And